Hello, everyone, and welcome to the TDWI webinar program. I'm Andrew Miller, and I'll be your moderator. For today's program, we're going to talk about composing your customer data platform on a modern lakehouse architecture. Our sponsors today are Databricks and Action IQ. For our presentations today, we'll hear first from James Kabilis with TDWI. And after Jim speaks, we'll be joined by Steve Sobel with Databricks and Michael Trapani with Action IQ for presentations and a panel discussion. Before I turn it over the time to our speakers, I'd like to go over a few basics. Today's webinar will be about an hour long, and at the end of their presentations, our speakers will host a question and answer period. So if at any time during these presentations you'd like to submit a question, just use the Ask a Question area on your screen to type in your question. If you have any technical difficulties during the webinar, you can click on the Technical FAQs area and you'll receive technical assistance. If you'd like a copy of today's presentation, please locate the resource window to download the PDF. And lastly, we are recording today's event and we'll be emailing you a link to an archived version so you can view the presentation again later if you choose or if you'd like to share with a colleague. Again, today we're going to be discussing how to compose your customer data platform on a modern lakehouse architecture. And our first speaker today is James Kabilis. Jim is a veteran thought leader, industry analyst, consultant, author, and speaker on analytics and data management. And over the past three decades, Jim has held analyst positions at Futurum Research, Wikibon, Forrester Research, Current Analysis, Current Analysis, and the Burton Group. He also served as Senior Program Director for Product Marketing for Big Data Analytics for IBM, where he was both a subject matter expert and a strategist on thought leadership and content marketing programs targeted at the data science community. At TDWI, Jim focuses on data management, which encompasses database platforms, data governance, data integration, master data management, data ops pipelines, and more. Welcome, Jim. And with that, I'll hand it over to you now. Thank you, Andrew. Hello, everybody. I hope you're having a good day wherever you happen to be. So it's all about composing your customer data platform on a modern Lakehouse architecture. So really, uh, in many ways, this is a two-track discussion. It's both the platform and infrastructure uh, needed to stand up a modern cloud-based data lake house. But really it's about making your customers happy, extracting the maximum value from your customer relationships by using customer data, customer data analytics, and really having a customer data platform to serve all of your channels, sales, uh, customer service, marketing, and any way that you touch the customer, you need a customer data platform in line to that whole relationship. So we're gonna talk about composable cloud data architectures as an enabler and a platform for customer data. And really what is a composable cloud data architecture? So TWI, we, we look at it in the following way. A composable cloud architecture is built from reusable functional components or microservices that are specialized for particular purposes, uh, storage, uh, processing, memory and the like, but also for the various workloads in the customer relationship management pipeline. And so a composable cloud data architecture is both built from reusable functional components and eliminates the need for a monolithic migration of an entire enterprise IT stack to this new cloud platform. Um, really, what it really supports is more flexible change management. Uh, for agile evolution of your enterprise data storage, processing, management, and workloads um, within a cloud computing architecture. So you can continue to upgrade and evolve your, your uh, customer data platform on the lake house as new requirements come online related to data storage, data processing, analysis, and so forth. In a survey that we'd, we've done in the last few years, we looked at, we asked um, uh, data management and professionals um, to define the key drivers of their business and where data, specifically customer data, comes in. So in a survey in 2021, we asked uh, practitioners from a technical perspective, what could be improved in your company's analytics effort to make it more successful? And what was clear is they said, you know, uh, tooling and platforms to enable improved and more consumable access to data and to analytics and for understanding, to enable understanding and insights from data. Um, so that's a, a deep stack of capabilities that in many ways, it's the customer data platform that we're talking about today. And really a key enabler 
for a high quality and robust customer data platform is that it, it incorporates artificial intelligence and machine learning inline and other advanced analytics um, to use statistical algorithms and so forth to distill customer intelligence from increasingly huge and diversified data sets that have been scattered all over your organization in terms of different databases, different applications, increasingly are being consolidated, those silos are being consolidated onto new uh, new platforms, modern cloud platforms, such as especially the, the cloud data uh, lakehouse. So really in many ways, the cloud data lakehouse is the convergence point for disparate data and machine learning pipelines and for platform, uh, for the uh, analysis needed to um, extract the insights you need to run your business and really to keep the customers happy. So when you're engaging your customer and you're using data as you must, as everybody does, um, you need to consider the entire customer relationship management life cycle. In terms of serving the customer, you don't just deal with the customer in say a retail, uh, uh, in a brick and mortar environment, if that's your part of your uh, your operating model, rather you interact with your customer across all linked business processes, campaigns, touch points, digital and analog and so forth, mobile and embedded applications and the like. So what you're trying to do with customer data is you want to use it to maximize the customer lifetime value, the CLV, which is essentially the difference between, uh, you know, max, well, first of all, you want to maximize your customer's potential monetary worth through the course of their relationship with you. In other words, you want to boost retention and satisfaction, loyalty, upsell, and the like. Um, and you want to, at the same time, minimize customer churn, you know, improve retention, and minimize the net present value of the cost of serving the entire customer relationship. And increasingly, what organizations are doing to boost customer lifetime value is that they're using machine learning and other data analytics to both find the insights necessary to make the customer happy, to upsell them, to keep them on board. Um, and they're, they're using inline machine learning and other artificial intelligence capabilities uh, to do that. Um, and so, we, so, for example, now we're seeing applications of generative AI um, in the customer relationship lifecycle uh, in marketing and other areas. So the, the use cases for machine learning and artificial intelligence continue to grow in the customer relationship management uh, in engagement. Because fundamentally what it's all about, your business, you stay in business because you have customers, because you're holding on to them, you're keeping them, you're growing those relationships. And that really depends on knowing who your customers are in a very intimate fashion. And that depends on having data, increasingly correlating and consolidating all the data in your customer relationship management, customer data platform. So knowing your customer depends on 360 degree analytics into who they are, you know, unifying all of your customer data. It's your transactions with them, interactions, profiles, preferences, propensities, and so forth. Unifying all of your and analytics surrounding the customer data, the historical data on what they bought from you and the, the nature of the relationship heretofore, the current status of how you're serving them now across your various channels, be they the call center, be they in person, be they through you know, mobile applications and so forth. Um, you're aggregating, correlating, contextualizing, and analyzing the full uh, breadth of customer data, but also doing predictive analysis. So you're, you're basically what you're doing is that you're unifying all time horizons, past, current, and predictive future uh, to be able to make the customer happy to anticipate what they're going to need and what they're going to demand, what they, you know, what will uh, help you to continue to push that relationship to the next level of satisfaction with both them, but also in terms of your bottom line. And really knowing your customer depends on unifying all customer engagement workloads, you know, upsell, cross sell, uh, retention, segmentation, and so forth. Unifying all your customer engagement workloads and all of your data and all of your analytics onto a strategic enterprise platform, the customer data platform uh, on the lake house. So as I've indicated, the lake house is the convergence point for both your data warehousing workloads, that's business intelligence and dashboards and um, operational decision support and the like, as well as your data lake uh, workloads, that's machine learning and data science, and artificial intelligence, the, the, the data lake house is the convergence point 
for those platforms as well as for the machine learning and data ops pipelines necessary to, uh, to source, ingest, prepare, and govern the data um, and the analytics that is increasingly executing on your cloud-based data lake hubs. So it's all about knowing your customer better is, is unifying the, your view of all the data and analytics assets pertaining to the relationship you have with them, unifying these pipelines, unifying the experience of your various channels and touch points in terms of their ability to access, analyze, and process the data necessary to understand the customer from all angles. But also the Lakehouse is very much your platform for unifying management, monitoring and optimization of the workloads uh, and the data itself um, uh, that helps you to understand the customer to be able to serve them and thereby keep your business thriving. So the lake house is a provides a unified abstraction for, for, for programming, uh, uh, you know, sales and marketing and other customer related applications in the cloud. Uh, increasingly, uh, you know, these applications are getting more complex, and you're using a lake house based architecture to orchestrate these capabilities um, to run your both your front end customer engagement, but also your back end fulfillment and logistics operations needed to keep customer happy. So the customer data platform on the lake house really drives self-service customer analytics. In other words, your sales, your marketing, your other you know, touch points um, use semantic search and you know, real-time query and visual data exploration. Of course, reporting and things like knowledge graphs and predictive analysis, of course, machine learning, natural language processing, embedded analytics. Use all these capabilities that are delivered through your lake house be able to understand the customer from all angles and to drive these insights into operational applications that are needed to run the business. So, you know, before we hand it off to our presenters and then the panel, I'll wrap up my, my portion of today's discussion with focusing on the need for a composable lake house for your customer data platform. So you continue to evolve your customer data platform in the cloud by swapping in and out capabilities needed to support the applications that you're using to manage the customer relationship. So in many ways, the composable architecture enables you to evolve your engagement with the customer as, you know, as, your, as your business changes, as the competitive environment changes, as your, your, your model of capabilities and services you're providing to your customer changes. So what, when customer data platforms are deployed on composable lake houses, you can uh, leverage your existing data storage and processing resources in a unified fashion. You can provide greater scalability and performance on customer data workloads. Um, you can lighten, or you could, uh, you could tighten uh, governance and security surrounding customer data and analytics by providing it all and hosting it all from a cloud-based uh, data lake house. Um, you can provide, of course, a 360-degree customer view and support flexible change management on, on CRM uh, uh, infrastructure capabilities, as well as support on-demand access to all manner of self-service data analytics across all customer touch points. And with that, I'll hand it off to Andrew to introduce our presenters. Terrific. Yeah, thank you very much, Jim. Uh, our next speaker is Steve Sobel with Databricks. Steve is the global industry leader for communications for media and entertainment at Databricks, where he is charged with solution development, customer and partner engagement, and account support for some of the world's most prominent media and entertainment organizations, spanning agencies and advertising, broadcasting and film, publishing, gaming, sports and entertainment, and new media. Steve works closely with strategic customers across the globe to translate what Databricks does and closely align platform use cases to help industry customers drive revenue and operational efficiency through more efficient use of their big data with Databricks Unified Data Analytics Platform. We're also joined by Michael Trapani with Action IQ. Michael is an accomplished marketing executive that has stewarded and admired brands such as Apple and IBM. He has decades of experience leading global marketing, sales, and strategy organizations, leading to successful exit exits through venture capital, private equity, and public acquisitions. Today, Michael leads product marketing at Action IQ, and in his spare time, he enjoys hiking, spending time with his family, and reading boring history books. <laughs> Welcome, Steve and Michael, and with that, I'll hand it over to you now. 
Great. Thanks so much, Andrew. And thanks, Steve, for that incredible explanation as we talk through some of the capabilities around composing your CDP on a modern lake house architecture. And Steve, thanks so much for joining us today. Of course. Thanks for having us. Awesome. So let's let's get into, I think, some of the high level things before we jump into some of the questions that we'll get into around the panel discussion. I think it's helpful to bring in and bring together the two audiences that tend to be most interested in this topic. And that's the data teams, as well as the line of business teams, typically marketing or customer experience. And when we talk to those folks, we usually hear two sides of a really compelling story. The first is the business team who, you know, let's say they're, they're the marketers who want to make better use of the data that they have. They want to use that data in their customer experiences because it creates better targeting. It creates a uh, better personalization um, and they want access to that customer data. Uh, and a lot of times that customer data is stored within a broader uh, data warehouse or data lake uh, or data lake house and it's difficult for them to get access to it. So they want data, they want to use it, they want to activate that data in their customer experiences, but it's not easy for them to do. Um, and then on the technology side, on the data teams, we often hear, you know, we want, you know, we, we invested in this customer 360 through our lake house. We want to make sure that that data is activated, used. We want to drive adoption for this customer 360 initiative. But oftentimes, because the marketing team can't access it easily, maybe they don't want to run the SQL queries that they need to, or, or you know, something like that to actually get access to the data, um, they find this data goes unused by these business teams. Um, and they're forced to do a lot of manual work, a lot of busy work, a lot of you know, query running. Um, and it's difficult to, to scale an operation like that, which is, was really the goal of this initiative to begin with. Um, and I'm wondering, Steve, from your perspective, if you see things like this with the, with the customers that you speak with over at Databricks. Absolutely. So, so I mean, we see kind of this topic of CDP be one of the, the most um, complex ones for many of our customers. And, and what we see in here, and, and I kind of came from the MarTech space before I was at Databricks, and, you know, we, we, we kind of saw a lot of marketers that were sold on this dream of like, you know, real time, one-to-one, uh, -one, anywhere, anytime, all of these omni-channel use cases, uh, sold on a dream, and then when they start to implement the dream, start to live a nightmare. Um, and for various reasons. U ultimately, what we commonly see with customers, uh, you know, wh whether it's marketers, whether they're data teams that are struggling with um, CDP, is it's a few different patterns. Um, first and foremost, like from a data engineering perspective, the number one thing that we tend to see with customers um, uh, it, when it comes to data engineering is CDPs are gone and, and uh, are kind of bought by marketers. Uh, and then when it comes to having the data and IT teams to support them, oftentimes that is not aligned. And one of the most critical workloads that we see kind of, which is success or lack thereof for many CDPs is bringing in clickstream data. Um, we see this commonly as like, you know, the, the, the barrier for many of our customers to get to real time to kind of have that full customer 360 I would contend like there's there's really no point in deploying a CDP if you're going to not bring in one of your most feature rich data sets, which is of course what what your uh, end consumers are doing on your website, what they're looking at, how they're engaging uh, with your content. So we see in many cases, you know, data engineers, you know, not brought in to kind of build and maintain those pipelines. We also see a pattern where um, you know, kind of uh, marketers forcing a data engineer to work in a CDP rather than working in the infrastructure layer. And ultimately, you know, as we kind of go through the content here, it's about having the right personas in the right stack and in the right tooling in order to enable their success. This goes the same for data scientists as well. Um, many CDPs have great data science capabilities, but data scientists are used to working in notebooks. They're used to working in, um, you know, not, uh, you know, kind of data science specific tools, not tools for marketers that, you know, maybe have an add on module for a data scientist. So we see data scientists kind of struggling with, you know, wh where is the right place for them to do uh, their job. And then marketers, they're kind of, you know, holding the bag of we've gone off and we've, you know, made this decision around a CDP, but maybe we're not bringing in our clickstream data. Maybe our data scientists are struggling with the tooling. So this kind of nirvana of, you know, one-to-one -one real time engagement is just that a nirvana simply because, uh, you know, the organization has not done the proper um, blocking and tackling of figuring out where does the CDP fit within the rest of the uh, modern, modern enterprise data stack. Yeah, and it's it's 
it's fair, I think, from both perspectives, where they're coming from. You can understand where both teams are coming from. I mean, I've been a marketer for you know a few decades now, and the idea of um, of of just being able, to, I mean, you sort of live and breathe in these tools and you need to live and, and die by your next marketing activation and how you're engaging with customers. Um, and if that data is not accessible to you, or at least it feels like such a hurdle to get access to this data, you're just not gonna do it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you, you have enough to do that it becomes a real challenge. It can be demoralizing for a lot of teams because a lot of times marketers, demand generation folks, uh, growth marketing, acquisition marketing folks will get requests from all parts of the business, from some executives, from someone who's got a bright idea. Hey, can we send a message to this audience in this segment, you know, really targeted, really tailored with a very specialized message? Um, and the answer is usually like, you know, that's technically possible, but I'm going to need to, uh, you know, uh, bribe a, a data engineer to, to give me a, a really great, you know, sort of shadow query that he can run for me so I can pull that list and then upload it into my marketing cloud and send that message. Um, and that's going to take like three weeks. Um, and so it's, it's a challenging experience. So like the marketing team wants the ease of use uh, that they're used to with their, the rest of their MarTech stack, right? They want to be able to point and click. They want to be able to drag and drop. They want that marketer friendly interface on top of that data. And then the data teams want to be able to work with the existing data infrastructure that they have, those enterprise tools that they've invested so much in, and that you know, centralized view of data um, with all the governance that comes with any sort of sensitive customer data operation that you need to set up. And so you have these like conflicting things. It would be great if you could have both of those things together. And that is effectively what a composable CDP built on a modern lake house infrastructure is uh, what what a what a composable cdp is is it is effectively decoupling the marketer friendly interface from the data storage and compute a traditional cdp bundles all those things together the day you, know, you got to import all the data you got to you know do all the transformations that are required and that's what allows the marketer to you know be able to map onto that data and, and navigate around it and slice and dice it how they want what a composable cdp does is it says no i'm not going to ask you to to send us all of the data make a copy of it and share it with us and bring it out of sync and add all these costs Instead, I'm going to map directly to your lake house where your data already is and do a native push down into that lake house and run those queries, run that compute in Databricks. So it's, it's a, a, a pretty significant change in what uh, both teams are used to. There's sort of not something like this available uh, traditionally with a, a traditional CDP. Um, I'm curious, like from, from your perspective, Steve, are you seeing this kind of uh, uh, sort of definition uh, make an impact on sort of the perceptions of, of your clients in Databricks? Absolutely. Like, and, and, and I think like the overall philosophical uh, kind of ethos that, you know, combined Databricks and, and Action IQ were pushing in the market is that your CDP should be an extension of your data management strategy, not a copy of it just for marketers. And this is where yes. we see so many organizations really struggling uh, with making their CDP decisions actually work for them. I, I know some of you might be familiar with a group called the CDP Institute. They did a survey, um, you know, a few years back where, you know, they asked kind of customer satisfaction a year into a CDP deployment. Like, where are you? Are you happy with your decision or not? The vast majority, I think it was something like 90% of marketers said, no, we hate our decision. And it's not because these tools don't work. There are amazing CDPs on the market, none better than Action IQ. Um, however, the challenge often is like the way that these things are architected, they're, they're purchased as kind of, you know, um, apps that you deploy rather than being part of a enterprise um, uh, kind of data management strategy. So, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of customers that are, you know, in, in this time where everyone is looking for, you know, TCO reduction, everyone is looking at the efficacy of their stack as to, can we get to real time? What's getting in our way? And kind of uh, I'm viewing and what we're hearing from our customers is like uh, the MarTech stack is almost like, um, you know, the ground zero for where folks are kind of pointing uh, their efforts in terms of optimizing cost, optimizing speed and getting to a simplified architecture to be able to enable 
uh, these real-time use cases. Yeah, it's it's really a, a dramatic shift. And I think, I mean, if you look at the traditional decision that a team would have to make, or you know, usually one team will, will make one decision, one team will make another decision. This idea, just to emphasize, on, on the left, is just what a traditional CDP is, right? Everything that you've you've heard about CDPs probably fall into this category, this idea of you have this bundled application, and in order to get that data from the data lake, the lake house, into that CDP, you'd have to make a data copy and then import it there, and all the risks and, and sort of cost that comes with that. The other option is the warehouse approach, which is what we're talking about here, this sort of data uh, lake house infrastructure approach, where all of that data and compute is happening in uh, the something like a um, a Databricks. Now, there's this third option that's emerging that I think is very interesting for this audience because a lot of times there will be a hesitation to take that next step of saying, okay, you know, all the data is in Databricks, right? Um, we know that the reality is that these projects take time. There's usually uh, legacy systems that take time to maybe import, maybe there's a long pipeline or a roadmap of projects to get all of the data in one place. And the marketing team doesn't want to wait that long, right? They want to deploy their use cases, they want to build ROI, they want to start using a CDP to make better campaigns. And what Action IQ offers that's unique to, to this market is this idea of a hybrid composable option, which is basically both options together. Uh, where you can run the bulk of uh, your data, which is stored in Databricks, in Databricks. None of that data is copied. It stays where it is. Uh, or maybe you're brand new to Databricks. You're a new Databricks customer, and you're starting to import that. And so some of it's in Databricks, but not all of it yet. And then for everything else, you can send that to Action IQ, and it would function like a traditional CDP, right? You'd send that data to Action IQ. And for the marketer, they don't notice the difference. They don't know where the data is. A lot of them don't care, to be honest. Um, but they, what they will notice is more data that they now have access to. Uh, and so that's a, a really interesting approach that Action IQ takes. Um, and of course, we offer this warehouse-only approach too. Um, but but we think this is a really important distinction. Um, and I'm wondering, Steve, like. You know, you work with architectures of these things. Could you maybe just walk this audience through what this kind of looks like when we're taking this Databricks first approach, this lake house first approach to a CDP? Yep, of course. So when we talk about the lake house, I mean, lake house is really um, the best of what you get from a data warehouse in terms of being a great place to run, you know, high concurrent, low latency workloads. The best of what you get from a data lake in terms of being able to handle any type of data and being a great place to run your AI and uh, ML workloads all from one uh, kind of platform. Um, so for us, like we, we deploy you know, on, on your cloud infrastructure, so AWS, Google, um, um, Azure, and essentially like if you're landing all of your data in inexpensive storage, be it S3, GCS, or, uh, or Azure Blob storage, essentially what, what we're kind of proposing is like you get um, you know, kind of the, the access to you know, inexpensive storage, basically any type of data that you need and um, basically do all of your ingest, your transformation, you know, your storage uh, on top of a Databricks. And essentially like what we talk about when we're talking about composable CDP uh, with Action IQ, it's all about optionality for customers. Meaning in some cases, customers are going to buy a CDP and they're gonna use it as a traditional CDP where they're building their audience segments. They're doing all of their uh, kind of segmentation before they're pushing it into uh, their activation channels. We have other CDP customers that you know are using a CDP for all of the connections you get to your you know downstream ad tech and martech stack. Essentially, this paradigm gives you optionality where you know, you can kind of get a best in breed architecture, a best in breed stack um, uh, where you know again this nirvana of being able to get to real time. Uh, you kind of have one zero copy architecture end to end with bi directional interoperability between uh, Databricks and between uh, Action IQ as the CDP. So you kind of get you know, an enabling architecture that allows you to get to uh, these real-time use cases at scale. Yeah, makes a ton of sense. I mean, when you think about the, the various teams that benefit from this, you know, from the CTO, the CIO, or the, the chief data officer's perspective, we're not locked into vendors, which is great. That's the idea is that you can, you can be agnostic to uh, both the, 
the CDP. If you want to change CDPs down the road, you, there's new tooling and, and interfaces that you want to take advantage of, but you want to stay with Lakehouse. Um, and it's the same on the other side. If the marketing team, uh, let's say you're not a Databricks customer and you want to adopt Databricks in, into the future, you're, you're agnostic to the Lakehouse that you use and you can adopt Databricks later. Um, and it gives you that, that reduced uh, cost of ownership. This idea of, I mean, if you think about a traditional CDP, you are paying for data storage and compute in two places, right? You have it over here in, in something like a, you know, a traditional CDP, and then you have something over here in, in Databricks. And that just doesn't make a ton of sense. Um, and so this reduces that cost significantly and, and brings it you know, together um, in one. And then on the marketing side, again, you have, you have uh, a treasure trove of new data that you can now use in your campaigns, things that a marketer doesn't traditionally have access to on their own, right? Clickstream data is great, and a marketing team can use that um, because they can put a tag on their website and they control all of that. But what about like you know their loyalty uh, uh, data or their shipping information or their, uh, their transactional data or their POC data from a... Uh, a POS system from a point of sale in a retail brick and mortar store, right? Like all this data that would would live inside something like a Databricks Lakehouse, you can now get access to and leverage in your campaign so that you can build segments off of all of that data now. So it's really exciting for, for this broader team um, and then this sort of set of teams. And I'm wondering, uh, Steve, if you could just give a quick overview of the, the partnership between our, our two companies, because it's, it's been a lot of work and uh, I think really exciting for the audience. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we've kind of talked about some of the challenges that we see in the market, you know, speed and ability to get to real time, cost and overall TCO of like, and, and as you just pointed out, you know, you're you're doing your compute in two different places. And, you know, at this time where everyone is, you know, trying to respond to the market zeitgeist of being able to get to real time, being able to get to one-to-one -one and being able to get to it in an omni-channel environment, Essentially what we're talking about is one architecture uh, so that you basically uh, are making sure that your CDP is an extension of your data management strategy, not a copy of it. So you kind of get an increase of control. You know, you're, you're thinking of kind of CDP and the interoperability that it is driving across your modern data stack and your modern MarTech stack. From a performance perspective, you know, really what we're trying to help customers here is how do you decrease cost? How do you increase the speed and the productivity of what you're doing? And I think something that's super important is keeping the, the roles and the personas within your organization in the right tools so that they can do your job, that they can do their job. Like you do not want marketers in many cases, um, you know, building and scaling out, um, you know, marketing use cases from the data infrastructure layer. Same thing, you do not want your data engineers and your data scientists uh, you know, doing what they do uh, in the modern MarTech stack. There are different tools for different purposes. So this whole enabling architecture is about, you know, keeping your personas in your organization in the right place so that they can be successful um, and doing it in a way that enables scale. Like I, I think for Action IQ and Databricks, like we've done the hard work for you in terms of the integrations, in terms of, you know, getting um, bi-directional data flow, uh, in terms of making sure that these systems interoperate so that you're focused on you deli delivering awesome engagement for your end customers rather than needing to keep the lights on between um, your, your enterprise data stack and your uh, enterprise MarTech stack. Excellent. Yeah, it's been, it's been a long time coming and I think uh, some, some really great work with, with, you know, between two really strong companies in this space, really leading the charge and in um, listening to the, the requests and, and the needs of data teams and marketing teams. Um, and then pushing pushing this forward to make sure that everyone's lives are both easier, but also we're reducing costs and we're creating better experiences for the end customer, which is what uh, which is what the you know the big goals are, especially from the marketing side. Um, so that's, that's a bit to that point. I know uh, Michael and I we met about a year ago at Reinvent, and we were talking about like composable CDP being like the thing. Uh, you know, if you look at the market right now, everyone is a composable CDP vendor. Uh, Databricks, we're pushing composable CDP as a enterprise data platform. So I, I really think it speaks to this need in the market of everyone struggling to, you know, get value out of the decisions that they're making around, you know, their various like data and MarTech stacks and, you know, kind of, you know, a, a kind of religious moment of 
we need to fix this and we need these things to interoperate. Uh, otherwise, you know, kind of we've been sold on this dream. We're living a nightmare uh, of being able to, um, you know, get to, you know, production use cases at scale. Definitely. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's an exciting trend and, and we're uh, we're happy to be at the forefront of it. So um, I think now is, is a good opportunity for us to to open this up for just a, a discussion uh, between the two of us. And I think we're going to bring in back um, either Andrew or James for, uh, you know, to moderate this panel discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you all, gentlemen. That was a fantastic presentation. Looks like Jim's ready to go here. So, Jim, go ahead and uh, start the panel discussion for us. Yeah, thanks. That was a great discussion, guys. So what I'm going to do is, in the interest of time, you've already answered, uh, really, the first uh, question, what's the modern composable data architecture, as well as what do enterprises gain uh, by deploying their composable, composable CDPs on lake houses? I'm going to skip to, you know, when, when customers, potential customers, are looking to acquire a composable CDP, um, clearly you're in the market, but can you sketch out like the, the, the broader stack? What is essential as a capability for standing up a composable CDP on a lake house? You, one of the features that you mentioned that enables integration between um, both uh, Databricks and Action IQ is the reverse ETL. Could you put that in the broader context, uh, both of you, or in any order, exactly what, what is needed in this, in this platform from an architectural standpoint? So customers can, can then compare and contrast alternatives to what you offer. Yeah, maybe I can, sure. yeah, for sure. Maybe I can take a first pass at this from what I think we should look at as far as what the marketing team is going to want. Um, and, and, and Steve, feel free to jump in after too. I think the first piece is when we're thinking about the core components of a composable CDP, I mean, first and foremost, you, you have to offer the marketing team what they're expecting to get from a customer data platform. And a customer data platform in marketing terms um, is the ability to build these custom intricate audiences using customer data and activate that data in the customer experience, right? So you're capturing data from a click stream from the website, you're, you're capturing data from other sources of data like the lake house, and you, you're able to activate that in a customer journey very easily, very seamlessly. Um, you're able to create all of these very specialized audiences. Now, from an architectural standpoint, I think there are three core components that you should look for. The first is this concept of zero copy, right? So the, the whole purpose of this is so that we're not making copies. You know, I thought Steve's point was great, where your CDP should be an extension of your data management strategy, not a copy of it, because that defeats a lot of the purpose of, of the investments that you're making on the lake house side. So it should be a zero copy architecture. Um, and that includes things like, you know, data sharing and, and some other capabilities, which sure, you know, make that data accessible within something like a lake house, but does not prevent a vendor from making a copy of that data once they have it, right? So that, that, that happens a lot with big marketing clouds where they have multiple components. And in order to get from one application to the, to the next, uh, they have to make copies of them from module to module. So zero copy is really important. The second is uh, the, the first thing that I mentioned, this idea of a no code uh, sort of a marketer friendly interface that can sit on top of the data, right? It's, it's you know, you shouldn't be asking your, your you know, comms associate uh, to write queries for data. Um, they're, they're just not gonna do it. And then the third is this ability to be agnostic with different vendors in the tech stack. The whole idea of this modern uh, uh, data stack is that it can be um, interoperable with other vendors using standard integrations, um, and it does not require you to adopt a single uh, vendor for, for marketing execution, for data management and storage, right? So those three components, zero copy, the no code interface, and vendor agnostic, is uh, is what we hear the most. I'm curious if it's the same for you, Steve. Yeah, I, it's those things. One other thing I would add, and of course, this is going to be my bias coming from a, uh, a data platform company, uh, is uh, machine learning and AI capability. Um, mm -hmm. We're seeing a lot of marketers where um, you know some out of the box CDPs do have you know AI and ML capability, uh, but you know we're, we're also seeing this need where marketers are wanting to work with data science teams to bring their own models 
uh, in productionize their own models around, you know, things like recommendation engines uh, or, and, and those models could, you know, either be shared with the CDP or they could be run from a data platform. But we're kind of seeing this like advanced capability around AI ML be like a driver for why a lakehouse based approach rather than a packaged approach. And having that optionality of, you know, data, data scientists being able to kind of build and scale, uh, you know, in the platforms that they use. So I think, I think you did a good job, Michael, of kind of tying the other, uh, the other pieces there, but, but definitely ML is, is a huge one we're seeing as well. Great. Who has the next question? So from the point of view of a customer, when should they build their own lakehouse based CDP versus acquire that capability through a SaaS based offering from the solution providers? Such as yourself, so build versus buy. How does that? Uh, what what what, what, what this, should they consider? The customer yeah. looking at how the business capability. Yeah, no, it's 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 an important question, and I think one of the the purposes of a composable CDP offering is that this isn't really the question anymore. Uh, we know that there are benefits to building um, a purpose-built infrastructure for your enterprise. Every enterprise is unique. They have their own needs around infrastructure, around data flow, around governance and security, um, and then activation for the business teams. Um, and that benefits something like a build, um, uh, and, and assembling best of breed components. Um, but then on the buy side, there are best of breed components that have been pre-built for you to build with and they're priced that way, right? So you're not buying a big you know, cloud platform and using that as your component for, uh, for a modern data stack um, or a lake house based customer data platform. Um, you, are, you are using the sort of assembly versions of these products, which have all the capabilities on both sides, but they're designed in a way to be assembled by you know, a data team that's trying to, to build a, a tailored infrastructure for their enterprise using the best tools available. Um, and so I would say like, this question doesn't really, you know, it, it's a logical question because it's the one we always ask, but it's not as relevant as it used to be. And I think this paradigm shift around composable CDPs is, is what's allowing for that. Yeah, I would, I, would, um, I would say that, and this might be a bit of a surprising answer from, <laughs> from me, I, like customers that are saying like, oh, I want to build my own like CDP from the ground up. Uh, my answer is always just because you can doesn't mean you should. Um, when you think about the value that a CDP offers, the out of the box connectors to all the data sources that you would need across, you know, your engagement stack, uh, easy capability for marketers to kind of build, scale, activate their audiences. CDPs are bringing a tremendous amount of value to the modern marketer. What we're saying with this composable framework, though, is getting to you know one-to-one -one real-time personalization at scale is not just the job of the marketer. It's the job of the data engineer. It's the job of the data scientist. It's the job of the CDO who owns that enterprise data strategy. Everything that we're talking about here is about driving interoperability between MarTech and the overall data stack. So. Like we have customers all the time that are asking like, hey, should I be just building my data, you know, my, my CDP on top of the data platform? Like, you know, again, like, can you, yes. Uh, is it is the juice worth the squeeze when compared to, uh, you know, enabling and buying a CDP to, you know, bring that extra layer of value for the marketer? Like I, I would contend that a, a CDP is a absolutely critical part of, of this equation. Right. Yeah, you know, hey, it's, it's, it's like, like, you know, we're not asking the build versus buy question around, you know, email service providers anymore either, right? So like it's it's this idea of like, do you want to maintain an interface? Do you want to maintain all the new capabilities and requests that you're going to get from the marketing team because they are going to be demanding? Um, the the basics will not suffice for very long. Right. And one last question before we go to the audience Q and A is, um, once you've decided on a uh, CDP and a composable cloud uh, lake house. Now, how should you migrate your legacy customer data platforms to this chosen architecture? What's the first step that enterprises should be taking on this journey? Steve, you want to take this one first? Yeah, I don't. I don't know if it's necessarily that much of a migration. Like, if you are, if you already, ha basically, it's it's less migration and it's more around data. It's more around mapping, uh, meaning. Where is your data flowing between, you know, your data stack and your CDP stack? Um, do you have a zero copy architecture? 
Uh, where do you have streaming pipelines? You know, are there is the resiliency built into those pipelines? So I don't I, I don't know that it's necessarily like a you're essentially keeping the data in your CDP. You're just enabling uh, again like that zero copy um, uh, kind of paradigm uh, through the rest of your data stack. Right. Yeah, that's that's the beauty of it, right? It's you're not migrating if, if it's in Databricks you're done, right? <laughs> That's step one, there is no step two. Um, that, that mapping function is really important, um, uh, but you know, to, I mean, I'll, I'll be really, really clear about this. We've, uh, right now, we, when, when we have uh, customers that are interested in using Action IQ and they're a Databricks customer, we say, great, uh, we go into a conference room and we can stand up Action IQ mapping on Databricks within a half hour usually, and then and then get like a marketing person in in the room and and starting to play around with audience segments using their Databricks uh, uh, investments and the data that's stored in there. So it's a, it's very simple to do. It removes a lot of the nightmares around implementing CDPs because you're not doing all of that ingestion of data, that transformation of data for it to work. Action IQ is very flexible in that it works in that way. So, um, so yeah, that's the idea. There really isn't a migration. It's it's just you're mapping things. Um, you're you're putting maybe the the names that you use in your you know for your data teams and data science teams into names and attributes that the marketing team might understand. But that's like a semantic exercise. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you might use a different word for segments versus you know audiences versus you know a, a code that you might use internally on a team, things like that. Um, but otherwise, like from a technical perspective, it's, it's basically not much. Well, that's a quick value proposition. That's excellent, gentlemen. I'm going to hand it back to Andrew, who's going to administer the audience Q and A. We see questions flooding in. So Andrew, you want to take it away? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you all gentlemen. That was a great uh, discussion there. Uh, so I'll start off with the first question here uh, from Michael. Uh, but of course, Steve, if you have something to add, please do so. Uh, so Michael, does Action IQ run inside Databricks or in another cloud? Uh, yeah, so Action IQ is actually a, a proud Databricks customer. Um, and uh, and we work with Databricks um, as well. We, we operate a lot of our tooling from Databricks. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so, so we, we certainly do, um, you know, we use a lot of tooling from, you know, in different components around AWS as well. Um, but yeah, we're, you know, we're, we're a first and foremost Databricks shop, but you know, that, that point around being agnostic to the various tools that our clients might use is really important to us too. And, and one thing I'll add on that, um, is for Databricks, we run within a customer's VPC. So essentially you're not having to pay for ingress or egress. You essentially like, again, the paradigm is you land your data on S3, you land it on blob storage in Azure, you land it on Google Cloud storage within Google. Um, you know, you get to take advantage of your low cost object storage uh, and essentially like that data lake that, or data swamp where you're basically pouring all of your data, we abstract as a, a uh, or we deploy as an abstraction layer on top of that. So ends up being a really great, elegant architectural solution, low cost, high speed, um, and you know, with with partners like um, Action IQ, you know, we're we're enabling you know business focused use cases uh, with that paradigm as well. Yeah, and and to answer the second part of that question around Action IQ's pricing model, in this case where the data and computer are running on Databricks, Action IQ's pricing is really just the license to use the software. So an annual license for for the team that could be shared cost between the marketing and, and data teams, if if you want to even make the case for that. Um, we see very quickly. Uh, you know, commitments to make high ROI returning use cases, you know, within a very short period of time, you know, weeks um, of standing this stuff up. So, um, so yeah, the pricing model is really just the license. Um, if you do want to send data to Action IQ for that example around that hybrid option, um, then that storage compute for the data that's inside of Action IQ, um, you know, when you run sort of queries and things like that. But, you know, for, for this use case of it running on Lakehouse, it's really just the license. Okay, fantastic. We'll move on to the next question here. Uh, and uh, Steve, we'll start with you on this one. Uh, does your architecture assume a centralized DL and DW? What changes with more of a distributed analytical data by business domain model? It's a really good question. Um, in this architecture, I mean, we, we work with, I mean, uh, no two architectures uh, are ever alike. Um, it, could it work with a more decentralized model? Sure. The vast majority, though, of uh, use cases that we're seeing is 
this is part of a kind of hub and spoke model where you know uh, uh, most of the data is kind of landing in your overall like you know data lake data warehousing environment at the enterprise level with you know all of the other data whether it be you know ERP data HCM data you know your customer data that's all kind of like flowing through um, so we it is more kind of the the norm is more of centralized than it is um, distributed from from what we've seen across our customers yeah and for those cases where it is not the norm where it's you know maybe you're new to databricks and you're still importing data or you're, you're making that transition over a period of time um, it uh, the action IQ component of this will be able to be stood up today uh, while while that transition happens um, and again from the marketing perspective you won't have to notice any difference um, you'll be able to send the data to action IQ so that over time as more data becomes accessible within Lakehouse within databricks um, it will sort of feel the same and the data teams will have the confidence that at least you know we are on the path to the types of data strategies that we want to implement versus having to sort of throw it all out and start from scratch once you you're fully live on databricks and one thing I'll, I'll add as well is like this is this is definitely a benefit around kind of this composable approach is when you're driving interoperability between your martech stack and your overall data stack at least for databricks we have a lot of functionality around, you know, row-based security, column-based security, access control. So essentially, like you're, you know, being able to handle like your IAM roles. So essentially, a lot of the blocking and tackling of what we do would help you enable a more centralized governance model rather than needing to have a decentralized model uh, based on, you know, needing to support different personas, different business units. So that's a, a again, kind of another, you know, I, I think a compelling event as to you know, why look at centralization versus um, more of a distributed model over time. All right, we'll move on to the next one here. Uh, Michael, back to you for this one. Uh, the, uh, the audience member writes, I often see marketing use MarTech CDP platforms like Adobe CDP, which duplicates or create redundance with Lakehouse. How do you tackle this from organization change management perspective? Oh boy, yeah, this is a really good question. And and the reality is that a lot of, especially marketing teams or line of business teams do have existing relationships with large vendors or big platforms like Adobe. Um, and, you know, some of these companies have CDP offerings, um, but to the point we were making that they come with their challenges of, of you know, uh, making copies of data and, and hosting it there. Um, I think the reality, and and we're a big fan, by the way, of these of these marketing cloud platforms for the things that they're good at, right? For for that sort of you know customer engagement side, that send engine, um, it's great. We're not in the you know email marketing business. Um, we like to connect to all of those things, and we know that the vast majority of Action IQ customers already use something like a, an Adobe or Salesforce to send their messages and actually engage with those customers in the execution side. Um, and so what we've done is we've built a lot of content and collateral guidance, especially for data teams, um, but also uh, assets that can be shared with marketing teams on how they can make better use of their investments with something like an Adobe stack, with something like an Action IQ. It's that whole idea of being vendor agnostic. Um, if you want to make better use of the investments that you made with something like Adobe, they're not cheap. Um, and if you want to actually send a better experience through that existing investment that you have with the Adobe Experience Cloud, um, you can use something like Action IQ under the hood, um, build those audience segments and activate them directly in Adobe um, and send those messages to those customers without having to rip anything out. That's the beauty of this is it's vendor agnostic. Um, and so what I would say is like, um, when you're trying to make that case to the marketing team, the question to them is, do you want more data that you can use with Adobe to send more personalized messages to your customers? Uh, and because we can give that to you, right? We have all of this data here in Lakehouse that you're not currently getting access to because you're just using the data that's stored in Adobe. And this is the bridge to getting more of that data from Lakehouse in use by Adobe. None of your tools have to change. This is really just a better way to bridge these two things together. All 
All right, we'll move on to the next one here. Uh, Steve, back to you. Um, the audience member was referring to, I believe, the architecture you uh, slide that you were uh, showing. Uh, so does this view you're showing also support a company with multiple customer MDM sources based on a business organization and legal reasons? Yeah, and, and this kind of ties back to the, um, my, my previous answer around a lot of the, the, the value of having you know, interoperability between MarTech stack and the enterprise data stack is you get to pass through all of the governance and controls that you have on your modern data stack and have that interoperate with your MarTech stack. So like what we see with a lot of customers is, you know, like whether it's PII information or whether, you know, depending on the industry, there's sensitivity around, uh, you know, uh, GDPR or COPA or, you know, whatever that the regulatory regime is, um, you know, we, there of course like needs to be a lot of you know um, uh, you know data lineage capability. There needs to be uh, data governance capability. There needs to be access control capability. So essentially, like what we're putting together is like as long as that MDM data or we we look at that as a source. So if that data is you know being landed within your data lake, essentially like we can pick it up, uh, but also we can kind of create that governance around it. So if you know it's not meant for certain people or if there's certain sensitivity. Uh, you know, there can be kind of, you know, row or column level, you know, uh, blockers to uh, to the data as well. So it's like, what, again, whether like MDM, HCM, ERP, like we we kind of view all of it as, you know, that source data that you would be feeding into your, uh, your data lake house. All right, fantastic. Uh, well, unfortunately, this does bring us to the end of our time today. I uh, would like to once again thank our speakers. We did hear from James Kabilis with TDWI, Steve Sobel with Databricks, and Michael Trapani with Action IQ. I uh, would also like to thank Databricks and Action IQ for sponsoring today's webinar. And please remember, we did record today's webinar, and we'll be emailing you a link to an archived version of the presentation, which you can feel free to share with colleagues. Uh, and if you'd like to uh, download a copy of today's presentation, please locate the resource window, and you can download the PDF. Uh, lastly, I'd like to remind you that TDWI offers a wealth of information, including the latest research, reports, and webinars about BI, data warehousing, and a host of related topics. So I encourage you to tap into that expertise at TDWI.org. And from all of us here, let me say thank you so much for attending. This does conclude today's event.